and I think we're all linked into uh, webcast. So, um, uh, good evening and welcome to the Cabinet meeting of the 27th of June. Uh, councillors and officers are reminded to put their mobile phone or electronic device on silent if they have one near them. And those present in the room should face forward, speaking directly into their microphones <coughs> and not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphones. Uh, please would remote participants mute microphones when not speaking as this will reduce feedback and background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the council joining us remotely should leave cameras on. Uh, officers leave cameras on only for the agenda items you're speaking on. Um, uh, if um, any are present, uh, sorry, present remotely asked to put cameras on so attendance can be verified if not already on. Um, so I think we have um, officers, Chris Watchman is remote, councillors Bayliss, Eleanor Kirby-Green, Harmer, and then from the screen I can see that um, um, Councillor Maynard, um, and Councillor Ganley and Councillor John Barnes, um, welcome. Um, after each item has been presented, I invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Uh, those members joining us remotely will then be invited to speak and they should indicate their wish to do so by using the raise your hand facility. Only those members of cabinet present in the room will be making the decisions and I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. Please be aware there can be a time delay of around five seconds whilst a remote participant appears on screen. Okay, so if we can please move forward to um, item one, the minutes of the last meeting to be confirmed as a correct record of the proceedings to be signed by me. Do you all agree? I move. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so if we move into item two, um, are there any apologies for absence? Please, um, um, Lisa. Yes, Chairman, Councillor Gia Wan and Chief Finance Officer Tony Graydon. Thank you. Uh, are there any additional items, Malcolm? No, Chair, there are no additional items. And are there any urgent decision items? No, Chair, there's no urgent decision items. Thank you. Disclosure of interests, uh, uh, members, please speak clearly if you have a personal or personal and prejudicial and say the uh, <coughs> agenda item it refers to. Uh, members with a personal and prejudicial interest will be asked to temporarily leave the meeting at the start of the item. Members will be invited to rejoin the meeting when the item is finished. Okay, so I think we are at um, the point of agenda item six, performance report for quarter. Um, ben, are you going to introduce this report, please? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, we were. Um, this is the uh, feed up from uh, overview and scrutiny that was discussed widely at the, at the previous meeting uh, and sent up with, with their recommendations to Cabinet for consideration. Comments at all? Thank you, uh, Councillor Field. Catherine? Yes, thank you. I. Um, well, reading the reference to Optivo, I have some concerns about the housing stock in the district, particularly the housing stock in the villages, um, which I believe some of it is very run down um, and would be very expensive to repair. And I understand that Optivo is trying to sell these properties. Now, I believe also there has been a promise that they will replace them within the area. The point I think we need to understand is that if village houses are being sold, um, then the village needs to have the new housing stock within it because that's where people live and that's where communities are and I would hope Optivo would understand that. Um, I hope that they could be reminded of this before they sell too many more. Thank you. Um, thank you Catherine. Uh, Councillor Byrne, Terry. Thank you Chair. Um, yes, we're in continually, continual dialogue with Optivo and with Southern Housing with whom they've recently merged or are about to merge. Uh, and this is one of the areas we're looking at. Optivo may be painted with a rather broad brush, brush when they say we're replacing housing in, in the same area. But as you say, it's important that that housing is accessible to the people in that village. So we will certainly be looking for an assurance from Optivo uh, and a strategy statement, in fact, as to exactly how they're going to monitor the replacement 
of these houses that they're selling off. So that is covered where um, the merger of Optivo and uh, health properties will be managed, so all of that will be within that overall arc of uh, management and monitoring? It will indeed, but I think it's important to get that particular statement outside the sort of global statements that we're going to get about the merger in general and Optivo are very good at painting a corporate picture but sometimes it's a little difficult to dr drill down into detail and exactly how their repair performance particularly affects individual residents. So we'll be looking for maybe more detail than they will initially give us but I assure you I would I want to be in a position to come back with a definitive statement especially on replacement of houses they're selling. Yeah, thank you, Terry. Are there any other members of Cabinet here that... Yes, um, Hazel, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, could I just refer to the um, funding um, part about the improvement of leisure facilities, that it says it, some of it was um, allocated to the BMX and skate park, and, of course, it wasn't. Um, and you did send round an email, um, Ben, which was much appreciated because you put all the costs and where and all the funding and where it had come from. But I think we ought to formally, in the minutes, um, record that 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 money was not um, diverted to the skate park. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. Ben, did you want to come back on that? Thank you. Yeah, thank you. No, no, you're all right. Obviously, I was incorrect in when I said that I, I thought that money had been diverted. Uh, what we have done is I've asked the, uh, the Democratic Services team to make an addendum to the minutes at the end, noting the, 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 the difference, and, uh, and then that will be approved at the next overview and scrutiny meeting when those minutes are reviewed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Sue Project, Sue. Thank you. I'm really good, glad that scrutiny members are interested in our, our recycling rate. Um, just to remind everybody again that actually recycling comes under East Sussex County Council. They do run from time to time um, campaigns to try and uh, encourage recycling, but of course we haven't got a budget for this, unfortunately. Um, and one of the things that was, wasn't clear from the from the meeting what had caused the, the slight drop in recycling, um, and. and Recycling nationally has gone down a bit, um, and uh, it's gone down a little bit perhaps because we're taking away our bring centres, because people don't use the bring centres properly, and most are now contaminated and go straight to incineration because <coughs> they're no longer recycling. Uh, so there are those problems as well. Uh, also, uh, we, we're coming into the next quarter which won't include garden, because garden waste will go down, so it's not, we're not likely to ever reach our target there. And, of course, we, we're also facing the, go, the government's new initiatives um, for uh, producer extended responsibility, which will change hugely what we're doing with recycling, because food waste recycling might, collection might start. Uh, also, bottle collections might be taken away from us. Um, so there's, there's a lot of, of what-ifs around the whole thing about recycling. Um, so we're not likely um, to actually hit our targets of 52%. I think it's unrealistic we'll ever hit that target. Um, Councillor Field and I are going to the Joint Waste Recycling Meeting at the end of this week, so perhaps we can all find out more about it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Reinhold, Jonathan. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, I just wanted to make a couple of points on planning. Uh, I think, um, firstly, it's important to uh, look at history. We really inherited an under-resourced department with a 25% turnover of staff, and, uh, and that was, that was fueling what uh, then became the backlog during the COVID period. And I'm really pleased to say, it, I don't think it's... I don't think it's good just to look at the, the, uh, the particular state of majors and minors. And uh, what we now know is that since September, the restructure, uh, and uh, since um, Miles Joyce has, has been with us, uh, applications have gone down from something like circa 800. I'm talking about the PS1 and PS2 applications down to uh, around 487, I'm going to say, is the current uh, last month's figure. 
And that's a significant reduction. I mean, it's uh, some, something like 300 applications. That represents about a, a normal quarter's application. So really strong performance in getting those numbers down and stabilising the team and, uh, and creating a, a, a positive morale in the team as well. And that has been done in the face of the first three months of this year. I think applications were up, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, something like 50%. So as applications have gone up, uh, the team have been able to hold the, um, the total applications at least at a flat level, uh, but we do want them to go down. Unfortunately, there was, a, uh, there, there was an acceptance of average performance in the past, you know, being in the middle, being the median, and, uh, and that's fine for reporting to government, but for our residents, we want to be at the top. We want to be within statutory limits, and a meeting has been arranged for mid-July uh, with uh, with Ben Hook, with Miles, with uh, uh, Sue Prochak, Doug, and uh, and Malcolm to figure out how we continue to bring those numbers down to the point where we are in a statutory uh, the statutory limit limits. Uh, I'd have to say that, as I understand from Miles, we also have validations, which is the bit before the application is actually worked on by officers, down to around two weeks, and I think that is a really good figure. I mean, that's a, that is a, very, that's a very healthy figure because many applications that come in don't come in with all the information, so it takes some time for the planning business uh, service to actually go through them, find out what the errors are, and put them back to the, the agents or the applicants. So I think all the directional uh, information is very, very good, and I think we are probably performing better than many, many uh, authorities out there. So uh, I just thought it would be worth putting that in perspective. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And, and, and I think we are, are making progress. And there's still to work to be done on it, but there is definite uh, progress um, being reflected on the data that we're getting through. Um, and uh, that is an acknowledgement to, um, to Ben Malcolm to for support the, uh, the review that I undertook. Um, also to Jonathan and your planning colleagues in bringing it forward and Miles who's given us an awful lot of additional support uh, where we needed it. So uh, thank you for that. Um, Councillor Byrne, Terry. Thank you, Chair. Um, apologies, I should have made, there are some comments I should have made on the housing and communities performance. Um, the first one is that we did meet our target on number of affordable homes delivered, which was particularly good. However, as you'll see, we've missed our targets in other areas. This is still very much due to coming out of COVID, the pressures on family incomes, and, and it, it chimes in with the various relief systems, uh, relief grants that we're, we're making to families in need. But what I would say is, even though we have missed our targets, we would have missed them far, far more, and it would have been a far worse situation have we not already taken the measures we've taken on trying to secure better rented accommodation, trying to secure more, um, more services to wrap around those in temporary accommodation to help them move back into mainstream accommodation? So it looks like a dire picture, but it's actually not. It would have been a heck of a lot worse otherwise. Thank you, Terry. Uh, are there any other members here present that want to make a comment or any officers? Deborah? Um, I just wanted to come back and support of Councillor Projac's um, comments regarding waste and recycling rate. Um, I think there's little doubt in the industry now that curbside recycling is the most accurate way of getting recycling done properly and correctly by our residents. It's uh, unfortunate that our bring sites are heavily contaminated, and, and although that's a small amount of tonnage, in respect to the overall tonnages collected, it still does make that small impact on our recycling rate. So I, I just wanted to um, emphasise that. And, um, you know, the, the, the proposal going forward is to look into closing um, some of the bring sites, um, many of them, because they're not being used correctly, and they do often have to be em em emptied as refuse, sadly. Um, so, and, and just a reminder, uh, in terms of the recycling, residents can put out an unlimited amount of recycling by their curbside bin um, or their sack collection if they want to. You know, we're fully supportive of as much as possible, as long as it's suitably contained. So I just wanted to raise that point. 
that will help us get recycling rates up, I think. Thank you. Yeah, th yeah thank you, Devin, for clarity on those points. I think they're very useful and um, uh, we're aware of. Um, Paul, if I could ask to finish up, but I invite those that are remote, if, if that's okay with you, and then you round off the, uh, uh, the report. Thank you. Um, so that's uh, Councillor John Barnes. John. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was grateful to Councillor Byrne for what he had to say about Optiver, but I think the situation does uh, need to be looked at very hard indeed. Uh, what they appear to be doing is selling properties rather than update them, insulate them, renovate them. And in particular, we've lost an old people's bungalow in Woods Corner. I know of no prospective replacement in Woods Corner. And uh, I know that Burwash Parish Council worried because properties in some of the areas around Stram Meadow are up for sale. And again, there is no likely prospect of Optivo building in Burwash. So we are going to lose rented accommodation simply because a registered provider doesn't want to spend money on updating it. I'm not quite sure what the purpose of a registered provider is if they're not going to upgrade the rented housing they took over from us and some which they built themselves. So I do trust that Councillor Byrne is making these points very strongly. Uh, thank you very much, John. I think they're very valid points, and uh, Councillor Byrne would like to respond. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, yeah, I fully support what Councillor Barnes has said. It, it, we will not let the registered provider get away with the answer, oh, well, we're building other stuff nearby. In these village locations, it's got to be far better than nearby, and it's got to re represent a similar amount of, com of accommodation to that village and that community. Um, why they find these things uneconomical, uh, I think that look needs looking at as well. So I, I really feel we need a, a pretty forensic report from Optivo around this whole strategy, and, uh, and we'll certainly come back and comment on it. Uh, thank you, Terry, and um, uh, we'll leave it with you to um, to keep the tabs on um, Optivo and to make sure that we are we are in, in ongoing yeah. dialogue. I think is the uh, is the word. Thank you, uh, Paul. If I can invite um, um, you to make any observations and comments for the work that was um, prepared by your um, the, uh, the scrutiny committee, mm -hmm. and uh, I quite like the layout of this report because it's, it means that we can focus in on what you really discussed, and uh, it doesn't seem to be quite so much. Um, the both sort of um, writing and, and everything else that goes with it. So, Paul. Good. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, you'll, you'll, you'll see the recommendations there. Um, the, fir the first one um, sort of come via uh, Councillor Coleman, really, with, with his position as, as um, spokesman on, 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 on these sort of matters. Um, we, we decided that over the last couple of years, central government have been very helpful to, to councils with assisting people with um, or councils with, with uh, rough sleeping. Um, and we were concerned that at the moment there's, there's no funding sort of uh, earmarked for it from, from government um, because COVID's gone. Um, but that doesn't mean to say that rough sleeping has gone as well. So that's our, that was a concern there we had um, because all of a sudden, um, you know, before you know it, winter will be sort of turn up and, and, and people through, through no fault of their own um, or bad luck um, could end up out on the streets and, and we potentially or, or councils or, or government haven't sort of um, assisted any, found any funding to assist them. So, so that was something that was of concern. Um, I think the Optivo merger has been mentioned enough. Um, so it's good to see that Councillor Byrne is on that. Um, so you, the waste collection and, and the recycling, we, yeah, we were concerned, and I know it's been covered, but um, we were worried that, you know, was it, have the rates dropped? You could say, well, the rates have dropped because maybe Amazon and, and the likes are using smaller cardboard boxes, but that's probably doubtful. Um, you know, have, have people sort of come out of COVID and, and, and haven't got time to do it anymore? Um, or, you know, 
has there actually been a, redu a, re a reduction in, in plastic and cardboard use? Who knows? So it would be nice to sort of you know, dial down. And if, if Councillor Projack and Councillor Field are at the waste meeting later this week, um, you know, there may well be answers there that, that, that cover it, because I'm sure it's not just us seeing a reduction. It must be across the whole of East Sussex. Um, and it would be nice to know the reason. And if it needs just a, you know, a, a simple reminder to people to recycle, then, then maybe we should do it. But if, it, if people have just gone off the idea of Greta Thunberg and, and, and forgotten about the environment and just want to fly them wherever um, and, and chuck everything in a black bin, then, then well, that's, that's a shame. Um, I think um, we, was, we had a, a concern over the additional income. The additional income in the original paper showed a zero. Um, but that was sort of explained away by Ben um, that we, that is not actually correct now. Um, because we've, since we restarted the um, pre application advice, the income, that income has increased. Um, so it should, by the end of the financial year, be about where we want to be um, with the additional income. So, so that's good, and that was a good explanation um, for that problem. Um, yeah, they were concerned that a lot of targets have been missed, but Ben, again, Ben went through most of them, and we sort of explained away a fair few of them. Um, so, so, yeah, it's, yeah, overall we're pretty good. We had a fair, fair discussion on it. Um, about an hour. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so I think we, I think we covered everything off. So, yeah, there, there, there was sort of concerns, but, but officers sort of answered, answered most of the questions. And I think we're pretty happy. And we, we've sort of, I think we're going to look, or, or somebody's going to look at, whether we're setting targets that are unachievable. Um, you know, is there a point of having a target that's unachievable? Well, possibly not. But then do you, why do you make life easy for yourself by having a really low target and just and permanently having a green tick? Is, is, that, is that the right way to do it? I don't know. You know, should you strive to improve stuff or should you just say, oh, well, we, we reached 10%, so we're happy. So I think there's a balancing act. But... Um, I, I, we keep an eye on things and we're, we're, we're pretty happy with them. Thank you. Okay, uh, Paul, thanks very much for those um, uh, uh, comments. Um, and and, and uh, I note that the next over, overview and scrutiny uh, committee, um, you're considering the Town Hall Renaissance Report. And uh, I know that there have been issues raised with regards to the scheme and the timetable, but I'm sure that the committee will give the project a thorough review based on all the information that will be coming available to you um, through Cabinet and for Council to follow on, and then we'll be in a good position to make a final decision later in the year. Um, you know, further engagements are planned with members and residents, so it's important that the, the, all the information is out there for everyone to comment on. Uh, I beg your pardon, Kevin, if I can just invite you. I didn't see you. Um... Yeah, I was going to propose that we... Uh... Yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. I'm, I'm quite happy in Councillor Jiwon's absence to, um, to propose this report. Maybe um, just a thought on recycling. Well, I've been sitting here thinking about it. This time last year, of course, we were all at home for 24 hours a day, seven days a week for a lot of the time in, these, in, in, in the figures that are being um, considered. So, therefore, we weren't going out to eat. We were all eating at home. There would have been an awful lot more stuff at home to recycle. So I suggest it's probably just... The fact that we're out and about again, we can go to work and go out to eat, that we're not standing, sitting at home. Um, so I'm happy to um, uh, propose the two recommendations as in the report. Thank you. Do I have someone to second that, please? Uh, Councillor Sue Projet, thank you. And all those in favour? And that is unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Agenda item seven. Um, Joe's not here to introduce the report. And I think Lorna has stepped in. Um, and thank you, Lorna, if you could uh, present the report um, contracting out of homelessness review. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, this report uh, sets out that we have a legal duty to ensure our decisions to refuse, um, when we refuse ho homelessness applications, uh, independently reviewed. Um, this report seeks permission to appoint a new agent to undertake these reviews. Um, the reason this has been externalised and not done in-house is because we have a relatively small housing needs team, uh, which means that senior officers are often involved in the investigations themselves um, and, then, and therefore unable to undertake a review. In addition to the current contract, in, in addition, the current contract is not performing particularly um, effectively. It is a relatively low value contract, um, but does depend on the amount of work generated. Um, I think last year it was about eight or nine thousand pounds a year. Um, so members are asked to note the council's obligations as set out in the report and to agree the appointment of a new agent to undertake this work. Uh, thank you, Lorna. Um, if I can invite Councillor Terry Byrne. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to put this in, in layman's language, you have to investigate. Someone phones up and says, I am homeless, you have a duty to home house me. That has to be investigated. It's not unknown for people to claim they're homeless when, in fact, they're not. Uh, also, there are some people who don't realise what their entitlement is. So having an external service, commissioning an external service of experts uh, who, who look at each case and determine its, its uh, validity or otherwise, and as Lorna said, it takes out any suspicion that the senior officers already involved in any investigation because by the time people are homeless we hope that we've already had our housing needs looking at them saying because we have a homelessness prevention team so it should all those people should already be on our radar uh, and it's very good to have that looked at independently from the outside and the fact that we're now commissioning uh, a different service, a more, a more efficient and uh, cost-effective service, I think is, is good news. I'm very happy that that's the move that uh, Joe Powell has recommended. Uh, thank you, Terry, for clarifying that. Uh, Councillor uh, Hazel Timpey. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, Lorna, you might not know this, but um, I mean, I was curious as to what this other agent, the one that we're not, was not performing, um, I'll be making sure that the new one has it stricter monitoring? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that that is part of this. Um, I, it is another council that undertakes this work, um, so councils can tend to do this for each other. I think it was a London borough that was doing this service at the moment. Um, I can't remember where, where we're going with it, but Councillor Byrne perhaps does. Uh, Councillor Byrne is itching to tell us. Uh, I am, I am. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, the lead officer for housing, Joe Powell, has looked at the service provided and the services recommending very specifically, and he's satisfied that uh, commissioning, as we are from another local authority, he's looked at their performance, and it meets, it meets our, our requirements. Yep, thank you for that, Terry. Um, yep, Councillor Sam Coleman, Sam. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, typically, I would be hesitant about outsourcing... Uh, in principle, um, but I think this is uh, absolutely the right move um, because it would be a disastrous to think, like, you know, it doesn't bear thinking about if someone who was in a situation where they were homeless was accidentally or otherwise categorised as not being homeless and left to fend for themselves. And it's absolutely vital we make sure that, you know, when we're looking into these cases, they're being looked into efficiently, um, with compassion and accurately as well, because... So many people are struggling, falling into poverty, falling into homelessness who have never been in that situation before. And it's, it's good that we're making sure that who we have looking at that is, is doing their job. And I hope the monitoring is nice and close so that if this new provider doesn't perform, you know, we can make changes. Um, but I think this is a, a positive move. Um, thank you. Well, thank you. I think we identified that the previous incumbent wasn't actually giving us quite the service we wanted and therefore the, uh, uh, the uh, lead officer decided to make a change. Um, yes, Terry. Uh, just a quick comment. Remember, to declare someone homeless is only the start of the process. That is when our housing needs team really swing into action to try and find a solution for those people or those families who have been declared homeless. So, as Councillor Coleman says, it's, it's very important to sort the wheat from the chaff. There are some people who do try and bend the system, 
very important to get rid of those and really concentrate all our efforts on the people, A, who have a real need, and B, who we've got a real chance of helping and returning to some sort of more normality and, and better family life. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Terry, are you going to move the report for the recommendations as stated? I am stated? very happy to move that report. And some and Hazel, Councillor Timpey, a second. Yeah, and all those in favour? And that's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, agenda item eight. The Burwash Neighbourhood Development Plan 2019-28. to um, This is Ben's report. Um, confirm the result, Ben, and the recommendation to Council um, thereafter. So uh, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <coughs> So this is a recommendation for Cabinet up to Council to accept the result of the referendum and uh, have the, uh, the Bear Wash Neighbourhood Plan uh, 2020 to 2028 formally adopted by this Council as part of its planning process. Uh, the referendum was held on the 16th of June with a, a total turnout of uh, 785 votes, which is 35% of those eligible to vote. An overwhelming majority, 755, voted in favour of adopting the plan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ben. Um, if I can invite um, Councillor Vinehall, Jonathan, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, very good result, 96%. I don't think a great deal needs to be said about that. That is uh, at the top level of neighbourhood plan results. The average is about 86% across the country. Uh, turn out a little bit lower than expected, perhaps, but uh, that's also uh, dependent on the size of a, a village. The larger it is, the lower the turnout, but still a very good, uh, uh, a good turnout, a good representative turnout. So uh, I'm very happy to uh, to propose this because uh, it's another neighbourhood plan that's been successfully achieved, and, uh, and I want to thank everybody who's contributed to that, particularly the uh, the planning department, who's who who there was a, there was an early patch of Rough ride, I think, for, for uh, the neighbourhood plan group and the uh, the um, authority, but we got past that and uh, helped them through the the final stages. Uh, very pleased that um, we have another another made, or we will have another made neighbourhood plan, and um, look forward to their update, which they'll unfortunately have to do fairly soon. Thank you, Jonathan, and I think it's uh, really quite exciting uh, for them to get to where they are on this. Um, Councillor Sue Project, please. Thank you. I'm very happy to second this and really congratulate all those people who have worked on this um, because, as Jonathan, as Councillor Vinehall has suggested, it hasn't all been a, 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 an easy ride. Um, we look forward to the government actually making this process simpler because uh, it is such a lengthy, hard process. Um, and, and as Councillor Vinehall has said, it's another neighbourhood plan. We have struggled in this council to get neighbourhood plans going. Initially, in fact, hardly anybody started, and Councillor Vinehall and my parish were the, the first, but there are other councils that have got neighbourhood plans across the board with all their parishes. And it helps us as a planning authority to have that because the evidence is that they actually deliver more housing than is allocated to them. Not in this Burwash case, but it is another made, well, another neighbourhood plan. And congratulations to officers in the council, but also to those volunteers in the community that give so much time and effort to complete these things. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, if I can invite uh, Councillor Ellen um, the Kirby Green, because I'm sure that she would like to um, speak um, uh, on behalf of the residents of Burwash. Thank you. Um, yes, I just want to congratulate everyone in the parish who's contributed um, to getting to this place. Um, Burwash, as a parish, is very fortunate to have such a dedicated team um, who've stuck at it, um, and despite all the ups and downs, and uh, some of you will know, but believe me, there have been plenty of downs with this uh, neighbourhood plan. So I, I'm really, really delighted. And as Councillor Projects just said, we've got to remember, of course, that these are volunteers. You know, the amount of work these people do, um, and they give their time and their expertise um, for the benefits of the parish, which um, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for all those people. Um, I would just like to also thank those members who are part of the Cabinet meeting um, in November 2020. Um, because you accepted and supported the argument from John 
uh, and me and Bellwash neighbourhood um, planning team uh, that the plan did meet basic conditions, which of See, officers were suggesting it didn't. But you, so thank you very much. We wouldn't be here now if you hadn't sort of supported mine and John's and accepted mine and John's argument. So thank you. And that decision obviously was vindicated by the result of the judicial review earlier this year. Um, so no, it's absolutely fantastic news. I'm so proud of the evening Burwash. And uh, yeah, look forward to it being made a plan and we can use it uh, with regards to uh, planning decisions moving forward. So thank you. Excellent. Yeah, it, it, it sounds like quite a bit of excitement in your voice, and um, I think everyone has quite rightly um, to be very proud of what they achieved. So I think Jonathan is going to uh, move the report. You've moved it. Sue has seconded. So if we can vote on that, please, and that's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Okay, let's um, move on to agenda item nine. Um, and I think uh, Chris may be joining us at some point in time on this. Is that right, uh, Chris Watchman? Right, okay. Um, so, Lorna. Okay, so um, he's arrived. Um, well done, Chris. Um, do you need to say anything, Lorna? Or, or um, I'll come in afterwards. You'll come in afterwards, yeah. will you? Okay. Uh, evening, Chris. Nice to catch up with you, and I'll leave it with you to bring this report forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this report um, details the discretionary couch tax energy rebate scheme. Um, if you remember, um, back in February, um, the government introduced two um, rebate schemes um, to help residents with the rising energy costs. There was the national um, mandatory scheme for everyone in CalStats Band A to D, um, and they also introduced a discretionary scheme for those residents that weren't in tax Band A to D. Um, this uh, report um, recommends um, how that discretionary scheme um, could work. Um, what the proposal is, is that um, uh, residents in council tax bands E to H that are in receipt of a means-tested benefit, i.e. universal credit, housing benefit, council tax group, um, a working tax credit, in income support, income-based job seekers allowance um, would qualify for this scheme. Um, also, in addition, um, for those residents that are on um, a low income, so they have a net income of um, no more than £257 per week for a single person and £384 a week um, for a couple. Um, the scheme um, can, can run until the 30th of November. The proposal is to run it in a similar vein to the national scheme whereas um, residents would need to make an online application. Um, what has been seen from the national scheme is that lots of residents um, have needed support with that, so officers would be on hand again to complete the application form um, with residents over the phone. Um, just to give you whilst, whilst, uh, a quick update on the national scheme as well, um, as of um, about half an hour ago, we've... Um, made 25,000 um, payments so far to residents out of a possible tw um, 29,000. So just, just shy of 4,000 still are still to go. Um, but those residents haven't applied yet. So, so we are up to date with all, with all the applications and all payments that have, have been made to date. Thank you. Yeah, well, uh, well done, uh, Chris. That's uh, quite a remarkable sort of... Um uh, uh, numbers you've quoted there. Lorna, did you want to add something to this now, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, I really just wanted to pay tribute to the Revenues and Benefits team, who this isn't the first scheme that they've been working on over the last two years, and they've worked really, really hard in administering all the COVID grants, the business grants, and it's just, it's just gone on and on. And they're a team that has just carried on, not moaned and got on with it, and also recognising um, that the customer services team have, have also played a big role in this in supporting particularly older residents with some of the application forms. And I just think it's right that we sort of note that and um, recognise the hard, hard work the team's done over the last couple of years. I think we'd all echo that. Um, Kevin, did, in, in the absence of uh, Councillor Giovan, did you want to make any observations before you move this report? Uh, thank you, Chairman. I think... I echo everything that's said about the Revs and Benz team. Um, they are uh, stars of this council. Um, the, the issues with this scheme are that it's um, not a lot of money. 
in, in the big scheme of things. £150 isn't much. It's a lot to administer for a relatively small amount of money, and we only have um, a, a small amount as well, the 294000 which is the discretionary pot. Um, I think the difficulty here is going to be finding some of these people um, and, and getting them to apply. This isn't quite like the Phase 1 scheme where they automatically qualify. This is where we've got to, that people have got to apply. So I'd urge that all councillors use their networks to get this information out um, and that hopefully that we will have a good comms behind this when, after it's been agreed tonight um, through parish councils as well. We'll be able to help out and, and get some decent comms out to get people to apply. Um, it's, it's generally going to be people in larger houses that haven't had the, um, the original mandatory scheme. If that's okay, I just want to uh, underline what uh, Councillor Dixon has said, and certainly I wrote to to, to Chris Watchman because, uh, for example, he was uh, an over 80-year-old who hadn't didn't pay by direct debit, and really, really worried and concerned that he was going to be made to give bank account details that he didn't want to give, um, and he actually got a letter. I, I asked Chris to deal with it. He actually got a letter within two days um, which reassured him. But there must be a lot of people like that out there. I don't know if you know how many, Chris, that we're trying... But we have to write to them individually, I think. With with the, um, the uh, discretionary scheme, um, we wouldn't necessarily be writing to the, uh, the individuals. It would be more about um, the communication to the district as a whole in order for, um, for the, um, the eligible people to, to apply. With the, uh, with the national scheme, we um, wrote to everyone that we believe to be eligible. And um, there's, um, so there's, there's, just, there's just short of 4,000 people that are still to apply. But a large, a large number of those applications have been completed by staff over the phone due to um, difficulties with residents not not being able to complete the application form themselves or being a bit wary of of giving the information. That's really reassuring. Thank you, Chris. I'm happy to second. Thank you, Chris. Is there a time limitation on this? You know, will it get to a point that we were saying, well, you know, we, we've we've advertised this, we've got it out there, um, you haven't come forward, um, and, and is that going to be it then? Will we have to sort of send, um, is the money actually allocated? It's not actually sent to us. Do, you know, do we have to give any money back or you know, what's the, the end game? Um, with the uh, discretionary scheme, we've got until the 30th of November to spend the money. Um, if it's not spent, then yes, it does have to be uh, returned to government. Um, with the national scheme, I think it's the end of September um, for that. Um, but we have got the option of, with the um, with the national scheme, of being able to credit the uh, account stats accounts of those residents that haven't applied for it. So hopefully no um, resident that is eligible to the national scheme will actually miss out. Thank you for that. If I can invite Councillor Ken, uh, Sam Coleman. Sam. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yeah, first of all, obviously, just echo the thanks to the revenues team and the customer service team. Um, for, their, for their work on this, um, and this is this discretionary scheme is important because the council bandings don't necessarily mean they don't equate to a person's financial situation. There are people on universal credit in bands E to H, and it's important that they are able to access um, the support. Um, but I would like to echo what Councillor Dixon touched on, um, which is this is this is pittance. This is a tiny amount of money compared to what's needed to get people through the cost of living crisis. I mean, during the time that this money was, the first scheme was being handed out, um, I, had, I had residents calling me saying they couldn't afford um, baby milk. They couldn't afford the, the baby powder for their, for their child. Things like that that really touch, touch a nerve. Um, and I think <laughs> this isn't enough. Um, the anti-poverty strategy that we're hopefully going to pass at the next cabinet meeting um, won't be enough. Nothing local governments can do is going to be enough because we need action from national government that's more than just... 150 quid, which frankly is, what, one week shopping for some families? If that, um, maybe two weeks at a stretch, it, it, it's nothing. It will get people through a week or two, um, and then they're back in the same situation they were before. Um, so I hope more can be done, and soon, because it, the situation is really dire. Yeah, thanks for your comments, um, Sam. Uh, Councillor Christine Bayliss, before we go to the vote. Yes, I just 
wanted to um, ask a question and to reiterate um, all the comments that have been made about the uh, revenue and benefits team. Um, I obviously work very closely with them on the business grants and I know how um, effective they, they've been. But I just wondered if there was some link across to our council tax reduction scheme, because, of course, uh, pensioners uh, receive a 100 percent council tax reduction scheme, irrespective of uh, what, what sort of property they are living in. Um so, for example, I think the last time I asked um, a, a freedom of information request a few years back now, there were there was uh, one or two people living in Band H uh, properties who who qualified for 100 percent council tax reduction. And I just wondered if there was a, a read across between that scheme and this and this scheme and whether um you know, you do hear stories sometimes that data protection means you can't share information from one scheme to another. But um, uh, that would be reassuring, I think, that all those people that get council tax reduction are notified that they may be eligible for this discretionary scheme. Chris, is there a comment you'd like to make on um, on that question? Yes, um, yeah, I, I do intend to write to all um, residents in receipt of council tax reduction that are in bands E to H, um, inviting them to to apply because that's the one group of residents that we we do know will will qualify for the scheme. Councillor Dixon, thank you, Chairman. Um, before I um, move this report, um, I don't think it's mentioned in, in the in the report, but I will mention that this is a, a similar scheme has been adopted by all councils in East Sussex. So we're not going out on our own on this one. This is a, a pan East Sussex scheme, so it won't be any different in Wildenor Hastings. The, the, the criteria will be the same, which I think is important. Um, on, on that note, can I move the report as, um, as printed and, and add a request that we get a nice communications email out to all councillors following this? Because, as I said before, and I'll repeat again, Communication is going to be the key with this um, because we've got to find these people to give this money to. It's not going to be an easy job. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Terry Byrne, are you going to second this report? Thank you, Chair. Yes, very happy to second. Unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Christine, your hand is up and so is uh, Ellen. I don't know whether you wanted to take them down. I'm easily confused. Okay, if we can move on to the next item, which is 10, item 10, thank you, which is Deborah's report, Deborah Kennedy's report, Head of Neighbourhood Services, um, to declare that objections have been received to proposed disposal of public open space at St Mary's Recreation Ground. So this is looking to move forward to complete the disposable way of a lease, yeah, uh, for the, um, the uh, model car racing. Yep, thank you, Deborah. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, um, St Mary's Recreation Ground is a large area of open space of approximately 13 acres in St Mary's Lane, um, which is approximately 3.4 kilometres from, or kilometres from uh, Bexhill Town Centre. The ground currently is used for general recreational activities, such as dog walking, and consists of some woodland, um, but is mostly grass. It is considered that a small section of the grounds could be better utilised in terms of leisure activities to encourage a more um, active and outdoor lifestyle. This report relates to the Council's resolve in January 2021 to grant a five-year lease, which was subsequently reduced to two years by planning consent, for a small parcel of land at St Mary's Recreation Ground to the 1066 Remote Control Racing Club to set up a small fence racing track and um, councillors have got in front of them um, a paper copy um, of a map showing um, the site outlined in red of St Mary's Recreation Ground and you can see the, the area outlined in red to the left of the ground that um, denotes the area for the 1066 remote control racing um, club to have. Um, Paragraphs two and three of this report set out the process officers have followed for the disposal of public open space. 
and that generated six objections from members of the public, as referenced in paragraph four of the report and as detailed in appendix A of this report. But just to clarify briefly, the two main, well, sorry, not the two main, but the main objections are set out. Um, well, the district council are not selling the land, but rather suggesting a two-year lease so that the provision can be terminated if a significant <coughs> amount of adverse comments are received relating to road congestion dis and disruption to residents and other users of the site. The rent of the land is, a, is proposed to be a peppercorn rent, at least initially, to allow the club to establish itself on the site. And the club is paying for everything um, to set it up, including the planning application process, all the facilities, the fencing, etc. This can be discussed and reviewed in time to come at the end of the, the, two, the two years if a further lease is felt to be appropriate. <coughs> the radio control cars themselves are virtually silent, as I believe can be testified by several councillors who attended the demonstration in August 2020. I think, Councillor Byrne, you, you attended and can testify to I that. I did indeed. Yeah, that's great. So, um, shouldn't be a noise problem from that point of view. The planning condition six of the application requires um, permission to be granted before the club can use any sound ampl amplification and the, and the electricity generators. So, um, the planning team would have full control over that aspect. Parking is to be permitted in a designated designated area around the leased land, which you can see on the plan you have in front of you, in front of you, marked in blue, going around the outside of the red um, boundary. Um, and that allows for 37 parking spaces. And it's anticipated that, that, that the members would prefer to use these parking spaces than park on the road or even use the car park because it's, you know, very close to the actual site. Um, Ultimately, um, the planning consent granted for up to two years can be withdrawn um, and the lease um, will t terminate anyway after the two years or if, if absolutely necessary, could perhaps be um, terminated earlier if, if necessary. Um, but we believe that the club you know, has every um, impetus to make sure it's well run, that, that the noise is contained and that any litter is well managed and the roads are, are well managed too. So it, it is in the, the club's interest to, to, to monitor that, as well as the officers, RDC officers, to monitor that as well. So in summary, the officers have considered the objections received and, and do not consider that the activities proposed will have a detrimental effect on residents and will more likely increase the use and value of this underused open space. So the Cabinet is recommended to authorise officers to proceed with a grant of a two-year lease um, to 1066 Remote Control Car Racing Club and on the terms previously approved by Cabinet. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deborah. If I can invite Councillor Sam uh, Coleman as a ward councillor, and I know that you viewed the site when it was up and running, and perhaps also uh, Councillor Jimmy Carroll, um, because I think you were at that particular demonstration. Yep, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I mean, first of all, uh, just to say, there, there, was, there was a slight issue um, when this notice first went out that um, it just said it was going to be a disposal order, disposal of land, uh, and some of the residents, uh, and myself actually, mis misunderstood that um, to mean that the land was going to be disposed of, which is you know, not a hard conclusion to come to. And I think we do need to watch going forward how we use sort of local government speak in these sorts of sensitive matters. Um, but it is not being disposed of, the land will still be there, it has been leased um, to 1066 um, RC Racing and I am very excited as a local board member, I have to tell Cabinet, absolutely buzzing for this because uh, when we went to view it on the demonstration day, it was like so, it, nothing I'd seen before, you know, cricket, football, skating, that sort of thing, part and parcel of, of, sort of local government recreational facilities, um, this is something a bit different. Um, it's something accessible to people of all physical capabilities. Um, you're not running around. You're not having to take part in sort of team sports. You're not having to sort of in engage in sort of strenuous physical activity necessarily. But you are outside. Uh, and your, your skill comes down to how 
you handle the remote control uh, and your dexterity and how you move the cars around and control the speed so they don't crash into another car. It's, it's, it's something that is a bridge between video games and sports and recreation. Um, and I think after the years that we've had um, where, you know, every study you can possibly read is saying young people's mental health uh, is, you know, crashing downfall, anxiety is increasing amongst young people. Um, this is something to get them out of the house, um, to get them back out into, into a green space, um, to play with their friends, to play with their mates in a constructive manner that isn't, you know, going to cause any trouble in the area. Um, and it's so much fun. It's so much fun. I had to go, uh, and I, I want to I be back there, every, you know, every week when it is open, um, and I will be if I can. Um, and the other thing I just want to say is I know residents have concerns, uh, and I understand those, and I'm sure some of those residents will be uh, listening to this meeting, uh, and I take this concern seriously, as I'm sure Councillor Carroll does as well, as do the officers, and that's why this needs to be monitored, and um, that's why this is temporary. If it turns out that they are suddenly going to whack out great big noisy petrol things that weren't ever in the sort of consideration, and it's going to sound like a thousand lawnmowers and people are going to be disrupted, then of course we need to act on that. I don't think that's going to be the case. I think residents will be pleasantly surprised. I think some of the residents who've complained will hopefully start to come on board with this, perhaps even bring their children or grandchildren down to have a go uh, when the club are operating. Um, but I think the club are great. They're great people. Um, they're really keen to get involved in the community. They're very keen to invite people from Sidley, from Bexhill, from, from what the wider area, into there to join their club. Um, they have spare cars and things, If you, because you, obviously you, not everyone can afford to buy a remote control racing car, and they have spare cars that you can use while you're there. Um, and they, they were at the Skateboard Open Park event, um, the, 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 the group who, who, who run this, um, sort of chatting to people and getting involved. So I really think this is a good group in a good space that's always been used for recreation in, in Sydney. Uh, and it's a very exciting and different thing um, for sports and for young people in Rother. Well done, Sam. I'm quite excited by it all. <laughs> which, which I think we would all share. Those that went to the demonstration, it, it was exciting. And uh, I do know the so, you know, of the, I met the individuals involved, and they all come over as being very responsible, very, very well organised. Um, and I think that's a real plus factor. Um, Councillor Jimmy Carroll, would you like to just to endorse anything there, Jimmy, that you were um, perceived from the outset? Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I agree with what Sam said. Uh, in the early days, we had a lot of Chinese whispers, uh, and I think we put a lot of them to bed, but there's some that still aren't put to bed. And these people are just vindictive. Um, the, the, the thing is, uh, they've got their lease, and hopefully they'll respect it, and they'll get on and they'll stay with us. But all ages are welcome, and they, they're teaching people, and that's what we want in the area. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jimmy, on that. And I think that uh, I did listen to the planning application on this, and it was very uh, thorough, and there's an awful lot of uh, thought put into it all. Um, with regard to uh, the uh, approval at the end, um, and I just hope that those people that were concerned will be um, uh, um, will, will have their concerns allayed in some way. Uh, Councillor Field. Yes, thank you. Um, again, I think this is an excellent idea, and I really think that this authority has a duty to cater to all age groups and all tastes and all requirements for activities. Um, however, I am going to complain because this council has a paperless pledge. And we've all been given a piece of paper. It could have come electronically. Furthermore, had it come electronically, I could have enlarged it and been able to read what it says on the map, which I can't in this very small print. And I do think we have a duty to, to do what we say we do. People say, what's the council doing for, for the environment? And I say, well, we've got a paperless <laughs> pledge. And here we are sitting with the public watching with bits of paper in front of us and extra bits of paper being given to us. So I really hope that we won't do that anymore. Thank you. Well, thank you for making that point. I'm sure that will be taken um, down the line somewhere. Councillor Terry Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, Sam made comments about the, the actual event, which are, were absolutely valid. However, when I went to the demonstration, I was very impressed with the number of young people involved in model engineering. So it's not only it's not like a toy that you get out to play with one day a week. These children, these kids, youths, fathers, it, it's got so much going for it uh, intergenerationally. And 
To the, peop to the people who complain, I would say that the quality of life in a town where you have a range of activity for younger people is nearly always better than if you have zero, nothing for the people to do. So anything that contributes to that and anything that involves younger people, and as I say, the model engineering is something that goes on all the time. It's not just on race days. These kids are, are building their cars, investigating, hopefully going on into, into valuable careers in model engineering. So it, it's got so many good things going for it in a much wider context than just turning up at a field and racing the cars and it's got a much wider context in leisure provision and youth provision in the, as, as far as the whole of Bex Hill is concerned. Yep, thank you for those endorsements. I invite Councillor Hazel Timpey to um, move the report. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to move this. Um, I also went to the demonstration, and I had a go, and uh, my car kept falling over, but then I managed to get it back up again. Um, but the, the whole thing is very, very sophisticated, um, and it's very, very impressive. Uh, it's like being at a proper race meeting, except it's all miniature. And, um, and I, I do empathise with the people that are concerned, but I, I, I think we have actually addressed um, the situation by making it two years, by make, monitoring it. Um, and I, I think the parking issue, it seems to be a bit of a... Bit of a a problem with that, that people think there's going to be no parking for them and they're going to be parking on St Mary's Lane. And of course, we've created parking around the actual square where they're going to be racing. So I do hope that residents that, that aren't too happy will, will give, it a, give it a chance. And um, on that note, I would commend it to the to Cabinet. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Um, uh, are you who's seconding this? I think um, it looks like you. Can. Yep, Jonathan. Yep, that's fine. Okay, we've got a, a move and, and, and second. So those in favour, and I think that's unanimous. And thank you very much indeed, Deborah, for um, being here this evening and uh, moving us through. This. Move on to uh, item eleven, which is the. Um, this happens to be St Mary's again. It's the new cricket ground facility for Sydney Cricket Club. Um, and quite a bit of work has been done on this, I know, to grant, and the uh, purpose of the report, to grant permission for the cricket club to develop a facility there. And, and those that don't know that St Mary's, it, it, it blends itself to a cricket ground. You know, it really does. It's got the backdrop of trees, etc. Um, it's flat. Um, it used to be played, rugby used to be played there. Hastings and Bexhill rugby played there. There was also football being played there. Um, and the sad thing in Bexhill, there are 11 cricket teams in Bexhill, and there are only three wickets. Um, the Little Common is used by Little Common, Bexhill is used by Bexhill, um, and there's that scruffy little cricket ground on the Downs, which has got a very, very poor changing facilities, and it's used by the thirds and the fourths of various things. So, um, you know, it, it, sorry, he scored runs there, well done. Um, but, um, you know, we do need additional sporting facilities, and I think this is so, so important. Um, and, and I can recall a few years ago when Bexhill Cricket Club were keen to perhaps develop it there, and um, <clears throat> they did invest some money there to get water onto the area, and uh, they also did do some preparation onto the cricket table. So I think this is a, another... I mean, I'm sure Sam's going to get very excited about this, and Jimmy, but this is coming forward, because at the moment, Sidley Cricket Club play at Sandrock, which is in Hastings, and they've been told you can't play there indefinitely. And that is awful, I'm told. So, um, Deborah, please um, bring this report forward because Sam's going to get excited. And um, this is, again, this is, a, this, is, this, is, this is a magic sort of moment that we're bringing more cricket facilities available. Thank you, Chairman. I think you've said it all, really. <laughs> I'm excited about it. Yes, yeah, so this proposal is to enter into a five-year management agreement with Sydney Cricket Club. Uh, for the laying and maintenance of a cricket square and a wicket at St Mary's Recreation Ground, and a five-year lease for a, a small portion of land <coughs> on which to site a container for the use by the club as changing facilities. So apologies to Councillor Field, but it's my fault we have a paper copy of this map, because I thought it might be... And I, 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 I did benefit for people to understand how this fits in with the um, remote control racing 
car track that we've just talked about. So, um, um, my fault. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, um, it's felt that the Cricket Club and 1066 Racing um, Club will complement each other. And the two clubs are keen to work together to, um, for mutual benefit, um, particularly over parking and maybe other facilities as well. Complementing in terms of one will be there Sunday, the other one will be there Saturday, and one day a week, and um, they will work um, um, to mutual benefit. And then to be clear as well, the, the lease is only for the land on which the container will stand, and the rest of the grounds will remain open to the public and unfenced. Um, and we believe St Mary's Recreation Ground is ideally located for Sydney Cricket Club to bring back the club to Bexhill on a permanent basis and reconnect with the Sydney community as a whole um, and its youth in particular. Paragraph 2 of this report sets out the club's aim to relocate and become well established in time to celebrate its 125th anniversary at its new home in 2026. So they're very keen. Um, paragraphs 4 and 5 of this report sets out the club's aspirations in the longer term to replace the container with a brick-built building on the same site that will support and sustain the club's activities into the future. In order to do this, the club will need to have the ability to enter into a long-term lease of up to 50 years for this parcel of land in order to raise funds and all, for all the above, and including any future car parking arrangements will be subject to obtaining the relevant planning permissions referred to in paragraph 7 and 8 of, of the report. So paragraph 8 sets out the class proposals to raise enough funds to lay the square in time to carry out work late summer or early autumn this year, um, if, if this all goes through um, today. And the club is confident that they have a team of volunteers and use of machinery to complete the initial groundworks to create the square and artificial wicket, and then for ongoing maintenance thereafter. Similar to the other sites in Rother District, parking will be allowed on the grass, subject to approval and an annual licence granted. And as I said just now, they can use the same um, parking area perhaps around the racetrack. Um, so, in, in summary, um, the Cabinet is recommended to, forgive me, I just find <laughs> the recommendations to authorise officers to enter into a five-year management agreement with Sydney Cricket Club and the laying of a cricket square and artificial wicket um, to agree to granting the club exclusive use of that facility um, and waiving the associated booking fees. Um, and what, what we mean by exclusive use is that Cricket Sydney Club will select the square and use the square. No other cricket club will be able to use that, that square and that wicket. It will be just for their exclusive use. They'll be paying for everything and all the grounds maintenance and things like that. And to authorise officers to enter into a lease um, for the container to be sited on the recreation ground subject to planning, uh, and then furthermore, um, to facilitate the construction of a permanent pavilion subject to plan permission in due course. Um, to authorise officers to proceed with the disposal of the land to be leased. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Deborah. Um, if I can invite the ward councillors, perhaps start with Jimmy, as um, uh, Sam, is, Sam is still your thunder, Jimmy, so you might as well get in first. Thank you. I'll hold him down for a while. Um, uh, it, this is a wonderful day uh, for, for Rother, uh, but Bex Hill, Sidley, it's, it's a plus. Uh, if you have gone up there at between 6 and 7 o'clock tonight and see the youngsters that were being taught how to play cricket, if you could bottle it, I'd have a pint of it. They're fantastic the way these people are working them. And this is what we need nowadays, this thing where the thumbs have got to go. We've got to get them using stuff. Uh, and I, I just, you just can't get enough of it. There are some people that are going to be against it, we know, but there's going to be more enjoyment out of it than anything else. And uh, long may it rain. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank, you, thank you, Jimmy. Before uh, Sam gets excited again, I invite Ke uh, Councillor Kevin Dixon. Thank, thank you, Chairman. And as a retired cricketer, um, <laughs> I, uh, this, is, this is something that 
also excites me. Um, if you look at our neighbours, Chairman, in Hastings, we used to, they used to have Priory Meadow, which has long been bulldozed for a shopping centre. The replacement at Horntie had two pitches. One of them is already gone and built over, and the other one is going to be built over shortly. Um, Bulverhyde had pitches. They've gone. Where I spent most of my youth playing cricket on the East Hill in Hastings, that's long gone. And all we're left with is two very substandard pitches now at Sandrock. You compare that to Bex Hill, where we've got Little Common that you've already talked about. You've got the Pole Grove, which is a superb facility. Um, we're going to have... We, get, we, we lost the Gullivers, but now we're going to get St Mary's back. And even the Downs is a decent place to play cricket. It must have done. I scored runs there. So I don't think there's many councils, Chairman, who are encouraging cricket to come back. Cricket is, is a dying... Uh, sport in a lot of places and, and it is excellent that this council is supporting this initiative so well and I really hope that, uh, that cricket in the area is, is maintained and, and thrives going forward so it's, this has my wholehearted support. Thank you Kevin. Um, Sam you I'm sure would want to uh, support this in, in every way shape or form but it's a family there isn't there? There's a family that I met um, father and son uh, I met some time ago, and their enthusiasm was just abound. He thought, goodness me, and they said, we're going to do this, we're going to do that. And we're now saying, well, here's the licence, get on and do it. Sam. Yes, yeah, so absolutely, Chair. Um, Trevor and Jamie are just, and the whole family, and the whole cricket club are just incredibly enthusiastic people who care about the community. Jamie happens to be a, a, a groundskeeper, a, a landsman himself, um, um, dealing with other cricket grounds, so he knows his stuff as well which is going to be really key when this, this comes forward. But, I mean, as, as Jim said, what, what a day. Um, I think some cabinet members or those listening may not realise quite how big a day for Sidley this is. Um, I think when, when Gulliver's fell, um, <laughs> cricket and football and pretty much sport in Sidley vanished. Uh, and, and although the clubs persevered, um, because if there's one thing I know about Sidley people is that we persevere, um, you know, they, they found that there was nowhere for them to play uh, in their home village. You know, Sidley as a village has the highest number of young people out of any uh, ward in Rother, um, the highest levels of deprivation. Um, but, but we also have some of the most keen sports people, young sports people, up and coming sports people, retired sports people uh, in, in the area as well. And this is just a fantastic day. I, I cannot, I, I could go on for hours about how amazing Sidley Cricket Club are. Um, I won't. You'll be glad to know. Um, but just to say that at every single community event I've ever been to in Sidley, Sidley, Sidley Cricket Club have been there. They've been putting on activities for young people. They've been showing people uh, all about what they do. Um, they raise so much money for the area. They, they donate to charity. They do everything you could possibly wish for in a good community cricket club. And they deserve this so much. They deserve this so much as do the people of Sidley. We've got cricket back now. We've got a brand new skate park. As of the last uh, item, we've now got uh, remote control racing cars as well. Uh, and I've also got the good news that Sidley United Football Club are now going to be playing uh, on site in, uh, in Gunters Lane, which is not quite in Sidley, but it's pretty much Sidley. All we need now is to get Gullivers back, and then Sidley will be back as the golden... Big beacon of sports, not just in Sydney, not just in rather in the country, if not in Europe, in the world. Sydney is the place for sports. Rother is the place for sports. This will help put Sydney on the map. Thank you very much, Cabinet. Yeah, I can't yeah. wait for you to accept this. Yeah, thank, th you. thank you very much, Sam. I think I should just go and have a light down. <laughs> Council Project, Sue. Thank you. Uh, I can remember uh, Councillor Oliver waxing lyrical about cricket years ago, saying what. Um, what Rother needs, what Sidley needs, what, what Bexhill needs. And I totally approve of these, uh, these two applications in front of us because we want, a, we want a variety, a choice, particularly outdoors. That's what people have turned to after COVID, outdoors. And um, I speak as um, the village with the home of Grey Nichols, an internationally known cricket bat factory. Uh, if you look at photographs in the paper of uh, cricketers, just look at the label on their bat. And more often than not, it would be grey nickels. And so, our, just to, to say, our cricket club in Robertsbridge 
is so oversubscribed. And we've got two junior teams and girls playing. So it's not certainly not a, a dying sport at all. And, and, and it's a great, great proposal. I think we're all excited by bringing sport where it hasn't been played, you know, for a while, and that's important. You know, how many local authorities are opening up cricket grounds somewhere? Very, very few. Many of them are closing because they're building on them and various things like that. So this is a real plus for us. Um, Councillor Hazel Timpey. Yeah, thank you. I don't know how to follow Sam, though, with all the enthusiasm. Um, yeah, this is just complements everything that we're really trying to do in Rother for sport and for people's well-being. And... You know, a council project hit it on the head. It's another outdoor activity which people are turning to. And um, I, I'm just delighted to be able to, to propose this to you all. And um, with that, I commend it to the Cabinet. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have we got someone to second it? Um, second it. And those in favour? It's unanimous. And having met the Ramsden family, Jamie is an excellent groundsman. And he prepared a wicket, I think only last season, at the Saffron's at Eastbourne. It might have been the year before. It was a county game. And the umpires um, advised you know, afterwards, they had to judge that they said it was one of the finest prepared wickets that they'd actually been able to assess. So the quality of um, groundsmanship that's going to go into St Mary's is undoubted. And um, I, I won't mention that I used to be the scorer for Sydney Cricket Club in 1962-63 because um, that was just one of these things. It was one of these local clubs, and if you went up there, you could always uh, be the scorer or involved in some way. So it's got a, a lot of affection for me. Okay, thank you for everybody. I think we've covered off everything this evening. Um, are we ready to close down our live streaming? And the meeting will close a little bit later than anticipated at 7.46. Kevin, I'm sorry. Thank you. <laughs>